I, I have a few statements to make real quick before I, uh, uh, before I start speaking. One of them is that I will also speak this afternoon for Eddie Simonis, who was the NASA Space Radiation Health Officer but could not attend. He's drinking European wines, I think, instead of Adelaide wines at this, at this time. I should also say that never, ever be on stage with a furry animal or a baby. You'll be upstaged. Never, ever follow an astronaut because it just... <laughs> And it's, that, it's my only complaint about the entire organization of this meeting is, is being placed after Dr. Thurst. And what a, what a pleasure and what a fantastic uh, introduction. He's making our, our talks uh, a, a lot easier. So thank you very much. So I'll bring us back down closer to the ground anyway uh, and, and discussing uh, the International Space Station experience that we've had at NASA. Uh, as uh, uh, I'm a member of the Space Radiation Analysis Group at Johnson Space Center. Uh, this group has existed as long as I have, since 1962. Uh, this is a 1973 photograph. If anyone knew uh, uh, Bill Atwell, we, we lost him last month. Uh, we have updated. It's actually a picture from 2011 of uh, some of our team members, but it looks a lot different than it did in the past, and uh, we keep evolving. We're in Houston, Texas. Uh, our state right now is not on fire like California and Australia. Uh, but I uh, sure wish uh, all of us the best with this, uh, this awful smoke and, and fires. Uh, the International Space Station has been inhabited continuously since the year 2000. It's inhabited now by uh, crew members, and we hope until the year at least 2024, perhaps even beyond that. We've had ex 61 expeditions. There have been many, many spacewalks that we worried about during construction, but they went quite well, almost all cases and uh, had good outcomes. The uh, longest period that someone has been in, on space station at one time, um, uh, the US astronauts, is 340 days. That's quite different from our experience in the past of, uh, of shorter shuttle missions that might last a couple of weeks. There uh, uh, has one, been one crew member, you can see Peggy Whitson here, who's been uh, on station for collectively for uh, uh, 665 days, quite remarkable. Uh, accomplishment. She's now re retired, and uh, uh, we, of course, wish her well. Scott Kelly has the 340-day duration record. Uh, I noted the Earth orbit is 51.6 degrees. That matters for a, a lot of reasons that we can discuss. Uh, we'll dis I will discuss later. So what does SRAG do, the Space Radiation Analysis Group? We provide pre-flight, in-flight, and uh, post-flight support for these missions, uh, which uh, include monitoring the, the space radiation environment as a lead for all of the international partners. Uh, we do vehicle and mission design evaluations as well, so uh, that includes augmentation of a vehicle with shielding, uh, augmentation of ISS as well. Uh, the Radiation Health Office is part of the SRAG team, and as a member of that team, we do dosimetry and risk analysis. We certify crew before they fly to make sure that in fact, they can uh, fly without exceeding their, their uh, career exposure limit. And uh, we're responsible for reporting what we've uh, uh, measured and the results of our analysis in terms of dosimetry and, and risk and communicating that to the astronauts every year uh, in, in the form of an annual report that they get. Of course, there's many, uh, many other stakeholders without really talking this slide. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, my slides are very, are don't, don't really show off our close collaborations with our international partners, so I'll leave that for the rest of our speakers today uh, to brag about that. But we have a very close uh, relationship with our international partners. You can see here, in addition to NASA, this is the Russian uh, Space Agency, Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, uh, the Canadian Space Agency you've just heard from, you will hear from uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have a very good relationship with them. I think Australians are as nice as Canadians. So far, my experience has been great, so that's an amazing thing. Uh, and we work well, of course, very closely with ESA, including with Dr. Ulrich Straub, who's a one-man show at times. I can't go anywhere without people have already been given a gift from, from Dr. Straub, so uh, he's a wonderful person. I don't know anyone more gracious. So we have a good working relationship, and that's my viewpoint. Hopefully, it's shared. Uh, but uh, we've, we've been doing this together for almost 20 years now. And of course we don't do what we do in a vacuum. There are many external advisory groups which uh, provide guidance and advice. That's part of the reason that we're here 
uh, this week is meeting with the ICRP on uh, some future requirements for uh, consensus requirements and consensus um, uh, hopefully limits uh, risk framework that that kind of thing. I wanted to point out to one of our one of our speakers uh, one particular document from the Institute of Medicine provides an ethical basis, a framework for doing exploration. Uh, it's not addressing solely radiation exposure, but all the health concerns uh, for, for exploration sp space flight. I think it's a very important uh, document. I believe it came out in 2014. So as our first radiation speaker, I need to describe space weather to, to the audience. And this is a description of the geomagnetic field. So Earth is a, essentially a, a dipole magnet. We have particles that are getting trapped in those field lines that you see there. Many of the particles are protons coming from the sun. Also, the uh, unidirectional galactic cosmic radiation is uh, filling up these belts uh, with, with particles. So the ISS, International Space Station, is, of course, in low Earth orbit and uh, is subject to some major sources of exposure, including you've heard about solar particle events. They can be very minor. They can be kind of nasty if there uh, is a, a coronal mass ejection of, associate them, you can have millions of tons of material uh, thrown off into space. It can be the entire sun surface pull, throwing off material, or it can be directed. In this case, uh, th this example in 2009, uh, 2000 was not directed at, at the Earth, but you can imagine that this is the solar disk in the, in the circle. We have about 100 Earth diameters across the sun. That's a lot of matter. It takes about three days or less for some of these CMEs uh, to reach the Earth. They pump up our uh, trapped proton belts in low Earth orbit. Space station is about 400 kilometers, which is just barely above the surface of the Earth when shown on this scale. Uh, the graphic that I have here is showing the, over the lifetime of the space station. There are, there's a metric called sunspot number, which indicates the activity of the sun and how it influences the local space radiation environment. By local, I mean solar system. Uh, the red lines are showing some of the major solar particle events that have occurred during the lifetime of space of station. That doesn't mean they're necessarily uh, significant in terms of radiation exposure, uh, and that's because the space station is largely inside the Earth's geomagnetic field, uh, and uh, and so they've not necessarily been. Uh, a, a big problem, but it does indicate the frequency of them. You might notice that there's a quiet five years in the middle of this uh, time period. Uh, around 2007 to 2012 was an extremely long solar minimum activity period. This is a time period when the galactic cosmic radiation is actually higher because they're not, these particles are not screened out by uh, the, uh, the sun, uh, the, the, the solar wind, the solar pressure of the sun. And you see that there's some clumping around the, the, the maximum solar activity, which uh, is what you expect. But it's not that, that a particle event couldn't happen at a at solar minimum. And so this, we have to be prepared for these solar particle events to occur at any time. And certainly, uh, timing is everything for going on exploration like tomorrow. So we're going to go when we can go. It won't be during solar min, solar max, uh, likely. Uh, timed around solar, solar events is what I'm saying. So we also have to know what's going to happen in the future, and this is an, an indication that we don't really know always. We thought that the solar cycle, a 22-year average solar cycle, would end perhaps in a year or two from now, and we're pretty quiet right now already. We have a very, very quiet solar disk. In fact, there's an uh, indication that we've begun the next solar, solar cycle because of this reverse polarity uh, event that happened earlier this month. Just an indication of what's to come, and, uh, and, and to indicate uncertainty in what the radiation environment will be at any time in the future. So, so I've mentioned trapped protons. I've mentioned uh, solar particle events. Uh, galactic cosmic radiation is a real problem uh, for us because it is always there. It's very difficult to shield. This shows that there are protons, or helium nu hydrogen nuclei up to iron, uh, and nickel actually is what we model. Uh, at very high energies, so the, the, the scale of this axis is, a, is an MeV per nucleon, so we've got um, many GeV per nucleon, they, these particles uh, peak just below one GeV. Uh, 
so they're very difficult to shield, very penetrating. And uh, this is a, a way to show the, relevant, the relevance of these three sources that I just mentioned. So uh, you can see these solar particle events here. These are two examples of solar particle events are relatively soft events. They don't extend influence above uh, maybe a GEV, probably much less than GEV at significant influences. Then you have these trapped proton uh, spectra. One shows during solar minimum, solar maximum uh, conditions. So this varies over that 11-year, 22-year cycle. And then you see the galactic cosmic radiation spectrum here. Uh, during solar minimum, you actually have more Solar maximum, you have fewer uh, uh, or lower fluence galactic cosmic radiation. So how penetrating are these? Well, quite, but below about 30 MeV or so, uh, a thinly, relatively thinly shielded vehicle will, will screen out the primaries or the incident particles on the vehicle. And if you have a moderately shielded vehicle, you can get 100 MeV particles uh, and lower uh, filtered out. Problem is they now have nuclear collisions in, involved, and those are creating multiplicities of other particles. Uh, we have some parameters such as altitude, which uh, uh, decide just what the exposure rates are. Uh, this is indicating the year 2018. Most of the time spent on on uh, uh, on ISS was spent around four, over 400 kilometers. This is rather new in, in, during this part of the solar activity cycle, solar minimum. Usually we fly, in the past we have flown lower at solar minimum because there's less atmospheric drag. Station falls, would fall about a football field length every, uh, I think every month or so, maybe every day. So it's got to be reboosted. Uh, the, uh, we have a suite of instruments for measuring what's coming into the vehicle outside. ISS, there's a charged particle uh, detector, and inside the vehicle we have tissue equivalent proportional counters, uh, one in the, the uh, Russian segment, the service module, there's not, IV Tipic, tipic is, uh, has been deorbited, is no longer with us. The, uh, the REM detector I'll, I'll mention later, it's a small USB device with a silicon uh, 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 detector inside, which we're using for uh, active dosimetry for radiation area monitoring and uh, uh, testing it out for, for some exploration uses. Uh, the RAD detector was, has neutron uh, detection capability and, and also a charged particle telescope. It's very, very similar in instrument to what's on Curiosity on the surface of Mars. Uh, and we've tested, used ISS as a platform for testing some of these new technologies, new instruments, including a crew personal active dosimeter ESA has one as well. Sorry, that graphic didn't show up well. These detectors are, are, are stationed uh, either in a fixed location or they act as a, as a uh, survey instrument. This is fixed. These are all TLDs, which are uh, TLD lithium-100 uh, TLD detectors. They're area monitors. Uh, they provide the total exposure, not uh, separating out trapped in GCR. In this uh, demonstration, I, ha I have these active detectors acting only as cumulative, uh, so we have not here shown the difference between the, the contributions of trapped protons and galactic cosmic radiations, but we do that. And the nature of the environment, uh, maybe it changes the factor two throughout station, the dose rates, but um, it's very pulsed. So when the ISS orbit precesses, through the South Atlantic anomaly, you may have heard, this is where the Earth sort of sticks out into its own magnetic field. Uh, it's over South America now. Uh, is when you get up, up to 90% of your daily dose, uh, depending on how the, the, the orbit works. But in any case, we have, uh, over the solar cycle, a, a difference between maybe 40 to 60% uh, uh, between trapped and galactic cosmic radiation in terms of, of measured absorbed dose. So it's fun to measure these things with different instruments. They see different, uh, they see different things, and we need different instruments in order to catch everything. This is fun because it indicates the uh, space station going through the South Atlantic anomaly, and you can see what's happening with these rim silicon detectors. These are actual tracks happening in real time uh, over a day back in September, a couple of years back. You can see that very high latitudes, you start getting galactic cosmic radiation. And I think you saw that during the South Lake anomaly passes, you can get uh, 
uh, quite a bit of proton exposures. So we're using these now as dissimetry to normalize our environment models on space station. Very, very helpful. This is a summary of the various uh, NASA programs that over time show that some of the short programs got very little exposure during short missions. Space shuttle where we flew uh, hundreds of people, the, uh, the crew doses started to increase. And uh, with the space station now, with these longer duration missions, these single mission exposures are getting up close to 100 milligray. There's, a, of course, a quality factor associated with this. It's on the order of three or four. Uh, but it, uh, with that quality factor, it would extend above the, uh, uh, the one-year limit uh, often used on the ground for terrestrial ex workers. So how do we control this? NASA has limits, and uh, uh, career exposure limit is shown here. Planned career exposure to ionizing radiation shall not exceed 3% risk of read at a 95% confidence interval. Uh, we also have limits for, our, for other tissue effects, non-cancer effects, uh, shown here, CNS, CBD, and uh, we don't think, we don't anticipate acute, uh, but we have limits to stop that, uh, prevent that. We have a quantity called milligray equivalent, or gray equivalent, which is, uh, uses an RBE rather than a quality factor uh, to fold in the, the response rather than, than for cancer, uh, for, for some of these, um, these uh, uh, limits and endpoints. So, how do, we, how do we manage things? Well, very much like terrestrial space workers and very different at the same time. Time distance shielding means a little different. Time could be the timing of an event, such as an EVA or a mission, as well as the duration of the mission. Um, shielding, of course, and uh, additional countermeasures really don't exist for us yet, but uh, this is going to be a, a practice that we may be relying upon for exploration. Uh, so we'll need radio protectants, radio pharmaceuticals, things that will last for a long time in space. So our objectives are to meet all of our limits, shield as best we can, alert our crews, shelter, all those things, we're doing them well, we're green, yet with that regard. So moving on quickly, I'm running out of time here, the uh, uh, modeling analysis uh, 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 effort that we have uh, includes modeling the vehicle, uh, modeling the radiation environment, uh, uh, in, outside and then inside, the vehicle, and rolling this together with a cancer risk model, which is called the NASA Space Cancer Risk in the CR2012 model. It's, uh, it's quite distinct from uh, ICRP approach of effective dose and that it's tissue age and sex, tissue age dependent sex specific. Uh, it uh, considers smoking status, smoking history. We have our own quality factor, and uh, it includes physics and environmental models, of course. So what we calculate is a probability distribution. The NASA career limit is at three. Uh, we fold together all of the multiple exposures into a risk uncertainty analysis, and we include uh, the fact that there are multiple missions, and we consider biomedical research study exposures as uh, occupational exposure, even though those are volunteer uh, activities. I won't go through the equations with you for, for Reed, but that's in the publication. Uh, we have a mixture model for relative risk an absolute risk this is my tip of the hat to epidemiologists here. We have uh, uh, modifying factors, which are dose rate and uh, quality factors folded into H to T. And this is what the quality factor looks like for ICRP 60 that you're all familiar with. Whenever you depart from one, your sievert is different from your gray. Uh, what you see in the red lines here are for the individual ions that are considered protons and heavy ions up to iron. The, this family curve shows you the, the quality factor for each one of those ions as a function of, of, of LET. Uh, the green curves are indicating the leukemia risk relative to the solid tumor risk, and that's a factor of four or lower um, in this model. I won't go over the parameterization except to say that it's a function of uh, kinetic energy, LET, and Z star squared over beta squared, which is uh, effective ion charge over its velocity. So it's a, bit complicated uh, uh, quality factor equation. Not only do we have that family of curve, but for each one of them, shown here, proton, silicon, and iron, you have the ICRP60 as well as the NASA quality factor with its uncertainty distribution. So we have these large uncertainty distributions, and uh, most of what we're exposed to in space is, is protons by far, and uh, we fold in the uncertainty uh, of the, uh, 
uh, of the spectrum in each organ individually. Um, I'll shortcut this to say that the quality factor is a little bit less than four. This is a representative uh, case where a female flew twice. Her combined read at the 97th percentile level was much less than three, so she would be uh, eligible to fly another mission. We're familiar with the tissue weighting factors. They're set in stone. This is a little bit different. It's not analogous, but it does show us the importance of various organs that we have learned on space station for females. The lung and stomach make up about 50% of the entire cancer risk burden. For, for males, it's substantially less for the lung. Uh, and uh, there's a distribution shown here uh, of, of uh, importance of these various organs. The, the, the ones listed in boldface indicate that with early detection and treatment, their uh, substantial survival probability increase. Uh, so that's uh, something that we hope to, to, uh, to, to take advantage of uh, with, with uh, early follow-up. One, one more quantity or metric is permissible mission duration. What this gives you is an idea of uh, how many days a specific astronaut can fly in space on a specific mission. And this is something that we report to, our, to the NASA astronauts. We have a lot of radiation exposure records, tens of, tens of thousands, almost a quarter of a million aviation uh, flight sorties, nuclear medicine, over a thousand exposures, uh, and a lot of medical diagnostic. This is an example of what we give to the astronauts each year to report to them. This is the first time I've uh, identified a crew member's radiation exposure, so I'm excited to do that. And I wonder if you can figure out who this might be. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Got it? So you can imagine how grateful I am to Dr. Thirst for allowing us to share his medical data, uh, something that it would have been very difficult for me to do, either impossible without his permission and, and difficult to get through the system. So his individual uh, mission exposures are shown here. The table shows uh, that as well. Thank you, Dr. Thirst. This shows his individual doses and absorbed doses, but also the 97th percentile read. They don't sum exactly because of our correlated uncertainties, but in this case, they, they, they round off to 0.66. Dr. Thirsk has a, a, a burden of 0.66. He still has 2.34 left over to reach the NASA spell career limit, which doesn't apply to him either as a CSA astronaut or retired. But uh, I, I would never consider him a quitter, but he's only up to 22% of his burden, and uh, I think he can be uh, recruited for a Mars mission, perhaps. He sure presents Mars well. Uh, but th this, this diagram is an Oc Health type approach, and it shows the individual missions, sum them up, and, and here he is relative to 3% NASA spell. Uh, lastly, for the summary chart is the PMD, so it's permissible mission duration. If you were to fly a space station mission in 2019 or in 2020, he would have 500 to 550 days before meeting his uh, NASA space permissible exposure limit. Uh, we provide details such as statistics for the uh, incidents as well as the uh, mortality uh, of cancer. We, we provide information about the radiation exposures that are not considered by NASA to be occupational. I got shy here and blocked out his, why he had all of these medical exposures, but uh, he did have a fair number of, of diagnostic exposures, x-ray exposures around his mission. He had CT exams uh, as well, and those are the ones that do count toward his uh, uh, career limit. Just to give you one statistic on our current NASA astronauts, including our candidates who have not yet flown, we've got 48 astronauts who are active now. We're about 10 times bigger, 12 times bigger than Canada. Uh, we have 31 who have flown at least one mission and 17 who have not. Of them, the metric that we would compare with their, their exposure, their career limit is 0.75. Uh, but if we went down to uh, a read limit of point, uh, just 95 percentile, and you get, you get back a little bit of, uh, uh, of, of exposure. And I think that might be something to consider when we look at our limits. I want to acknowledge uh, our collaborators, again, our International Space Station uh, partners. Oak Ridge works very, very closely with us in support of these risk analysis. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, there are several questions uh, coming in through the app. Thank you very much. Uh, 
there, aren't, there isn't much time, but if someone wants to run to a mic, they might get a question in. We'll take one or two questions. Uh, so many interesting ones, it's hard to pick. Here's one that's a bit practical. Oh, they keep coming in. Stop. <laughs> um, so, uh, paraphrasing, <clears throat> to protect astronauts from uh, high doses during a solar particle event on the ISS, is it possible to move the space station into Earth's shadow and keep it there until the event is passed? Would it be useful to do so or comment on other techniques? Okay, the concern is that the, the crew would be, crew and their equipment would be exposed to a solar particle event of such magnitude that it would be uh, detrimental to them or, or the vehicle. Uh, and that certainly can happen, and we do monitor for that, and we do have fly rules which state that uh, we, we alert during an event and move our crew members to a well-shielded location. There's one in the Russian segment in the uh, as a service mod module. There's other locations where we'd move our crew to be better shielded. It's a very rare event that it, that, that to, to, for that to happen, uh, but it would be so energy intensive to move the, the space station to any other orbit at all. Uh, it's a football field long. It's massive. Uh, it'd just be very, very difficult and expensive uh, to move it. Uh, there's, there's an astronaut, Franklin Chang Diaz, who had a wonderful uh, uh, variable specific impulse. We need a rocket that he wanted to uh, slowly keep the station boosted up. I thought it'd be a good idea to move it to an orbit that would help us go to the, uh, go to the moon and, and, and use that. But, uh, and then we could simulate a Mars mission. You could just be on space station. In any case, uh, uh, instead we're going to build Gateway. I'll talk about that this afternoon. Great. And I'll, I'll ask uh, one more question that's a combination of several from the audience and the, those that we don't get to, please remember to submit them again for the panel session at the end of the day uh, because there'll be lots of discussion there. Can you comment a bit on um, whether or not there's any individual dosimetry of astronauts and um, what, uh, what dosimetric quantities might be used, are the operational quantities valid, but just generally about the individual uh, dosimetry of astronauts. You mentioned uh, area dosimetry, but not individual. Yes, I, I skipped over the fact that they wear a crew personal dosimeter, which is almost identical to their, the uh, radiation area monitors, the t their TLD-100s. They also have other tiny little detectors in them, but we, we use those as the official dose of record or, or exposure of record. So these are TLD-100 badges. They're passively, the passive instruments, of course. We read them back here on the ground. Uh, try, try to not lose them. Things get stuck in strange places in Soyuz. Uh, the, Future though, starting maybe next March or April, we'll have an active uh, uh, dosimeter that they will wear instead of their TLD 100, and that will provide a readout for the crew, and they can read their their exposure levels. So, look forward to that. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Yes, thank you.